I, <laughs> I was waiting for the signal from my, um, from my wonderful team. But hi there and welcome to my home. So this is me here in California on a Sunday morning sipping my tea. <laughs> and, um, and I wanted to show off this beautiful, this beautiful shawl that I got as a gift today. I'm so happy, uh, um, you know, and I will be, I'll share a video in the comments of the whole story behind the shawl. And uh, so it's a beautiful lady by the name of Lisa sent it to me and I just love it. I love it. It feels like a hug. So thank you. So anyway, welcome to my home. Uh, and I would love to hear from you. If you have any questions, please post them. I'll get to them a little bit later though. I wanted to start by sharing a couple of things that I wanted to speak about. Um, so right now I am in the process of writing my third book. And one of the reasons why I, um, I very often when people come to me with, uh, with their questions and their issues. And one of the things I tell people is to journal as they're going through the process of working through their issues or of trying to heal their issues. I ask people to journal because when you journal, a lot of stuff comes up. And I recently learned how to journal. Um, my, my editor, she told me that when you write, just don't think write as if you're writing for yourself, which is the best way to write and just write and whatever comes up, comes up. Because remember, you don't have to share everything with the public, just write. And then all these emotions come up and it's very cathartic. So I'm really enjoying writing my third book because I'm feeling it's very cathartic. As I'm writing, I am healing. It's almost like I'm sharing my journey with you because I am uh, tempted not to really censor any of the things that are coming up for me. And so as I was writing recently about certain things that were going on for me, I realized that <clears throat> I'm someone who has been extremely sensitive, sensitive to my surroundings, sensitive to other people around me uh, since I was very, very young. I mean, I believe that all of us are born, uh, you know, with this knowing of our connection, the connection that we come from. We're all connected in the other realm. But some of us are actually better at knowing where our own um, being begins and ends. But others of us are not that good. We don't have that great boundaries. And so where we um, so where our energy ends and the next person's energy starts, we don't have very good boundaries. And you know who you are if you, if you have that issue where you don't have uh, good boundaries. It's when you feel the emotions of other people as strongly as you feel your own. It's also when people tell you things that impact you and they kind of stay with you and you feel them physically. Um, so I realized looking back on my life, you know, I was kind of wondering, did I only develop this since the near death experience? And I realized, no, it was long before that. I have always been that way where things outside impact me and they impact me physically. I'd love to hear from you if you relate to what I'm saying and I'd love to have questions from you. But anyway, this leads me to the story that I wanted to share with you. So as I was growing up, because of my culture, you know, I, I have an, uh, my background is uh, that I'm Indian, ethnically Indian. Uh, even though I have not lived in India, my parents are Indian. My parents had an arranged marriage. So as I was growing up, uh, the only thing they knew for me was to, um, was that I was to have an arranged marriage. <clears throat> When you live in a foreign country and you are, let's say, I'm sure people who are Indian or maybe other cultures will relate to this. When you live in a foreign country, as was the case for me, being Indian, growing up in a foreign country, my parents were more determined for me to hold on to the culture and not forget it because they were aware that I wasn't being exposed to it in my surroundings. I wasn't being exposed to it in my school um, or in my neighborhood or with my friends who I used to meet and play with. So they were more determined to teach me the culture and they brought me up to believe that I would have an arranged marriage. 
What does that mean when your parents bring you up for an arranged marriage? It means that everything that you learn growing up, especially as a woman, is geared towards making you a better um, match, a better wife, so that you are more attractive to a prospective husband. Because the goal of the parents is really to get you into the best possible home. As an Indian girl, when you marry, and particularly at, uh, in the 80s, which is when I was growing up and going through this, when you get married, you're not just marrying the, the guy, you're marrying his into his whole family. You become a daughter-in-law in the family. So the whole family has to approve of you. So as my parents were teaching me to be a good wife and a good daughter-in-law and a good homemaker and all these things that it takes, um, at, at least at that time, for me and my culture to be a good wife and a good prospective uh, bride in an Indian family, as they were teaching me this. So to put it into perspective for you, I was somebody who had different ideas. I didn't want an arranged marriage. I was somebody who was a huge fan of Cindy Lauper. You remember her? She was the one that sang, girls just want to have fun. So I was like a huge fan of hers. I would play that song over and over again at top volume, loud volume from my bedroom at home. But even worse than that, I would dress like Cindy Lauper. I would emulate her. I just loved her so much. And in those days, you used to be able to get these um, uh, hairsprays that were in different colors, you know, like neon colors, neon green, neon yellow, neon pink. And they were hairsprays, which you could wash out once you sprayed your hair. So I would spray my hair with these stripes down one side. And I had my hair cut pretty short, which is, again, something that goes against my culture. So my parents would freak out because if you can just imagine... Cindy Lauper, Cindy Lauper's parents trying to get her into an arranged marriage. That's what it was like for my poor parents. So, so I really feel sorry for them thinking back. So anyway, one day they were so frazzled, they said to me that, they, that this Indian guru had flown into town. We lived in Hong Kong at that time. And they said this big Indian guru had flown into Hong Kong and um, and he was giving these speeches and lectures. And one of my dad's friends who was involved in hosting and inviting this guru, he had agreed to give my dad and my family some private time with this guru. So my parents were thrilled and they said, we're taking you to see this guru to ask him why it's so difficult to get you married, to get you into an arranged marriage. I mean, that sounds really funny now, doesn't it? When I look back, I laugh. So they took me to see this guru. And so there was, a, you know, and everybody there at this event, they were wearing beautiful Indian clothes, very modest clothes. And I was in Western clothes. I was in jeans and a colorful t-shirt that kind of reflected my Cindy Lauper personality. And I had my short, punky hair. And so I show up uh, like this kind of young, somewhat cocky. But even though I say this, remember, I was always an extremely sensitive person. So my parents bring me to this guru and actually say to him, our daughter is in her 20s and she's still not married. And we are having trouble getting her married. She's not agreeing to people. People are looking at her and feeling that she's not right for their family. We don't know what to do. So this is my parents saying that to the guru right in front of me. And the guru looks at me and the guru actually says that it's because I am spoilt. It's because I have a big ego. And he rattles off like 10, 15, 20 things that are wrong with me. And, um, and I'm sitting here listening to this. And, and this guy is like a guru who attracts huge audiences. And I actually said to him something like, but what's wrong with expressing myself? What's wrong with just being who I am? I actually asked him that. I said, you know, honestly, until this moment, I didn't know that there was something wrong with me. And I'll tell you why I didn't know there was something wrong with me. Because everything I was doing was no different 
than my peers, the kids I had gone to school with, the young women who lived in my neighborhood, who went out to work or followed their dreams or followed their passion. In my culture, we were never encouraged to follow our dreams or follow our passion or, or to express ourselves or to be who we are. No, we were taught to be demure, subservient, and small. And now here was this guru saying the same thing. He was reflecting everything that, um, that, that I was being conditioned to believe. Now, coming from this guru, it had a transformational, a transformational effect on me. And when I say transformational, it had the opposite of what you want transformation to be. In other words, after this guru said all those things to me, I started to dim my light. He even went as far as to say, when I asked him, I said, but what is wrong? Does that mean there's something fundamentally wrong with me? What is wrong with expressing myself? The guru actually said that, of course, it's wrong. You want to perfect yourself so that you will be able to attain nirvana. Nirvana is the equivalent of going to heaven in, in, uh, in Christianity. Basically, what he was saying was that I did not belong in nirvana the way I was right now. <clears throat> he said, I have to cleanse myself of all these ego-based attachments. And I had to become somebody that was more pure. But what he meant by being more pure was somebody who was more subservient, somebody who was more obedient, somebody who would have an arranged marriage and serve a future groom and his family. In my culture, uh, at that time, what I was brought up to be was somebody who would be subservient to the family. I was not allowed to work unless the groom's family allowed me to work. That's just how it was in my culture. I had to please the entire family. And men were always seen as more superior than women, and the women had to listen to the men in their family. It would be their dads, their brothers, and then their future husbands and their future in-laws. So basically, after that encounter with the guru, after I went home, there started my journey because I was so scared <clears throat> about not reaching heaven or nirvana that I started to dim my light. That was when I started to make myself small. That was my journey towards smallness, which eventually led to me getting cancer. I had dimmed my light so much, made myself so small that I became invisible, that I eventually got cancer, I withered, I died. And only in death did I find out that our actual purpose here is to shine our lights as brightly as we can, to embrace who we are. Because by dimming our own light, we don't help anyone else. We're just maintaining the darkness. And so my message to all of you, especially to those of you that are really sensitive, you know, um, is that it's so important for you to embrace your ego. And the reason I say that is because um, many people confuse egocentric with the embracing the ego it's but it's actually two different things being egocentric and embracing the ego i want to repeat this is actually two different things the ego is actually a part of who you are and i realized you know as i was growing up that when i would then go and see even other spiritual teachers spiritual gurus they all, nearly all of them, would say that we have to squash the ego. We have to suppress the ego. This, all of this contributed to me making myself small, to squashing who I am, to dimming my light. But um, it was when I died, I realized that I had got it wrong. Or maybe they had got it wrong. Or maybe they weren't teaching it to us correctly. Being egocentric doesn't serve us and it doesn't serve the people around us. But embracing your ego is actually really good. So here's the thing I want you to know. If you are somebody who is 
afraid of embracing your ego because you are afraid of your ego taking over. And to give you an example, just this week, a lady said, ask me a question. She said, I'm afraid to be myself because I can't tell when it is the ego or when it is the authentic me. Do any of you have that problem? That you can't tell whether it's your ego speaking or the authentic you speaking. So here's my key to you. The fact that you are even concerned that it might be your ego, the fact that you are even afraid that you might be, that, that you don't want your ego to rear its head and you need to suppress it, it actually means the opposite. It means that you need to be, you need to embrace your ego. The fact that you are aware of your ego means you are a sensitive person. You are someone that the world needs to hear from. You are someone that needs to embrace your ego. Because if you really were egocentric, you wouldn't even worry about your ego. You would be so self-absorbed. So egocentric means being self-absorbed to the point that you are not aware of other people and the needs of other people. That's what egocentric is, and that is a problem. But many people who are sensitive are dimming their lights because they're so afraid of their ego. They're so afraid of embracing their ego, thinking it's egotistical, that you are not sharing your empathy with the world. You are not taking on leadership positions. And what I want to say is the world today needs you more than ever. Today, what we're seeing on mass media, you know, in the media, in the news, everywhere, everything that's making headlines, everything that we're seeing, the stories we're seeing out in the world, everything, people who are in leadership positions, all of them, many of them, I won't say all, that's probably too much of a blanket statement, but many of them are lacking in empathy. They're lacking in sensitivity many of them. It's not about being politically correct. It's about being sensitive. It's about being politically sensitive. It's about feeling. It's about empathy. It's not a false political correctness. This is what we are missing today in leadership positions, in political positions. <clears throat> We're missing that in media. We're missing that. And the reason I believe, one of the reasons we're missing it is because all the empaths out there, all the sensitive people out there are hiding. And they're hiding because they're afraid of what's going on out there. They don't want to absorb all that energy and so they hide. And secondly, because when we are taught to suppress our ego, even if you are a sensitive, empathetic person, you are going to suppress your ego and you're not going to take on leadership positions. So I want you as an empathetic, sensitive person to share your light, shine your light in the world, embrace leadership positions. The world needs you now. The world needs you now. And if you are someone who's concerned about the ego, it already means you are not egocentric, okay? So I hope that message was fairly clear. Uh, and it doesn't mean there are not egocentric people out there. There are, but currently their voices are the loudest. We need the empathetic people to embrace their egos and start shining their light and sharing it with the world and being who you are, be who you are. So let's go on to questions. And uh, the beautiful Milena is with me again. This is the first time I've seen her in two months because I've been traveling, then I got sick. So you're going to hear beautiful Milena's voice. Um, so Milena, and it was her birthday yesterday. Happy birthday again, Milena. So, so by all means, wish her happy birthday in the comments. So <laughs> Milena, what's our first question? All right, well, the first one is a fun one. Gretchen wants to know if you've met Cindy Lauper. <laughs> mm -mm. It would be my dream to meet her. Oh my gosh, it really would. The people I want to meet, crazily enough, are Cindy Lauper and the members of ABBA. Oh my God, I love their outfits back then and that song Dancing Queen that still makes me so happy. I just love the people from that era. <laughs> 
Lucy is also a, a sensitive person and a, a healer, and she wants to know if you have any suggestions on how to remain a clear vessel for spirit, allowing the spirit to do the healing for the highest good while she remains clear of whatever people are releasing or whatever negativity is going on. That is such a great question, and you know, and so much of my new book is actually going to be about that. It really is going to be for sensitive people and people who absorb everything that's happening in the world around them to their own detriment. Um, and so the suggestions I have, the first suggestion I have is to be aware that sensitive people have trouble saying no. And one of the reasons they have trouble saying no is because they have trouble with boundaries because to them what other people want seems bigger um, than what they want. In other words, the needs of other people seem more and bigger or as important to us as our own needs. We can't seem to differentiate. So the first thing I would do as a sensitive person, so number, excuse me, number one would be starting to look at everything I've taken on, everything I'm doing, and evaluate what are the things that I should have said no to, but I didn't. So really it's about getting stronger about saying no. And a lot of sensitive people in their heads, they think saying no means being mean, being bitchy. No, it absolutely isn't. In fact, saying yes to things you don't want to do is being mean to yourself. You can say no in the nicest possible way. There are many ways to say no, like let me have a think about it, or let me get back to you, or let me check with my, in my schedule. Um, or you can even say, you know, could you check in with my assistant? She knows my schedule more than I do. And, you know, there's all kinds of nice ways to say no. Uh, and saying yes to something out of obligation is actually not being honest with them and it's not being honest with yourself. So, so number one would be, where will I say no? Where have I been saying yes where I should say no? Number two is check your receiving channels. The other thing that empaths and sensitive people do is we're very, very good at giving and giving of ourselves to the point of getting drained, but we're not good at receiving. So I would check that. Check your receiving channels and force yourself or allow yourself to receive something good every single day, whether it's coming from someone else or whether it's coming from yourself. So remember, receive something good every single day. The third thing I would do is journal, write, get it out of your system. You will find out so much from the words that you write. And these are really important. And thank you for that question. That's such a great question. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this name correctly, so I apologize if I'm not. Um, Shyam asks, uh, what do you think about black magic and souls which are slightly on the negative side? Do you have an opinion about what's going on with them or what, what they've been through? So just an opinion, and so I, I'm not an authority on this, so I'm just sharing an opinion. I think that all of us, um, we have access to our inner mystic, particularly I believe empaths, sensitive people have access to it, but there are some people who, um, because maybe because of negative experiences in their life, I mean, I. I would be careful if I knew someone who was taking revenge on people and felt they had power, uh, I would be wary of them and, and be careful of them. Uh, I don't think it's a positive thing. I don't think they are connected in the, in the most ethical or right way. But there are possibly people like that. And if you believe somebody is like that, then if you are someone close to them, a parent or somebody close to them, I would really encourage them to seek help and to seek love and to take a more loving path in whatever way you can. Maybe they are just crying for help or calling for help. They need to know that they, are, they do have access to some, a beautiful energy, but that it's more powerful when used for good rather than bad. And this is what people need to, do, to know, that it's much more effective for the world and much more powerful when used for the good of humankind and not for bad or negative. Hmm. Muna asks, how do I show my gratitude to the universe, to God, um, 
everything changed since they've been focusing on, on being grateful. My life is love and action. My life is a miracle. Well, how do I show my gratitude? You are by being love in action. So w when you feel love for the universe or for God, um, first of all, that is amazing. That means you feel love for yourself. The way to show gratitude is by paying it forward to other human beings. Because the, the only answer or the, the solution to every problem in the world is love. That's my, that's what I live by. I won't even say that's my belief. That's my truth. That's what I, uh, what, what I aim to always live by. And if I feel gratitude to God, the universe, to anything, I will show that by showing love to the people around me, to the people I touch every day. If you really want to, if you really feel this excessive flow of love, like, oh my God, I feel so much love for God, you know, share it by going to people who have less than you, who are less fortunate than you. Share it by uh, giving stuff to homeless people, people who are needy, and show them love, not just by giving them gifts, but by sharing your love, cook them something, give them a hug, give them warm socks in the winter. So share your love with the world. The world could use it, really could use it. And the, when the world embraces you, blesses you, thank you for that, Mona. You want to do one more question? Okay, one last question. Caroline asks, will you cover receiving practices in your new book? Will I cover? Yes, absolutely. I will absolutely cover those receiving practices. Also, I want to mention that my previous book, What If This Is Heaven? There are a lot of exercises there too. And in the book, What If This Is Heaven? I speak quite a lot about the ego and about the misconception of the ego. And I speak about how ego only gets in the way when we lack awareness. As long as your awareness is high, you don't have, and when I say awareness, it means awareness of love, loving yourself, loving others, awareness of the needs of others. As long as that is high, the higher that is, the more you need your ego so that you can create your own boundaries. Because if your awareness is too high, awareness of other people, your sensitivity is turned up too high, and your ego is too low, then you have no boundaries, then you don't know how to take care of yourself. So uh, I do speak about that, the awareness and the ego balance in my other book and how the ego has been misunderstood and people with high awareness have no boundaries when they have no ego. Um, but anyway, uh, I will have a lot of new tips in the new book, but that's not slated to come out till next year. I'm having a lot of fun writing it and that's why I encourage people to journal and to write. And um, so in the meantime, please give me your comments in, uh, in, on Facebook. Please send me an email through my newsletter. Send me questions for other Facebook Lives. And, uh, and connect with me, on, uh, check out my newsletter, my website. And I look forward to seeing you all next week. I'm going to commit to doing another one next Sunday. I'll see you all at my home right here next Sunday over morning tea. And let me know where in the world you are and what time it is for you. I'm always curious to know that. Love you guys. See you all next week.